My name is Greta Anderson. I'm a principal at Balderton Capital. For anyone who doesn't know who we are, we are a, a multi-stage fund based out of London, investing in the best European founders, building businesses worldwide. Uh, we, are, we invest both from at, at the early all the way through pre-IPO stages. Our current funds total 1.2 billion between them. And so t today the topic of conversation is, is disruptive technologies in, in agriculture. And you know, to many generalist investors, agriculture you know, remain, or the perception is that it kind of lags behind other, other industries. And um, as a generalist fund, you know, we have made some out there investments, and in investments that are not your typical SaaS company, whether it's lab-grown meats, um, vertical farming, sort of hardware businesses that, that some investors sometimes shy away from. And another one is Better Origin, who I have photos here today. Um, so yeah, to begin, maybe you could introduce yourself and speak briefly on what is your business, uh, and a few sentences on the journey so far. Yeah, for sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Fotis. I'm a CEO of Better Origin. Uh, at Better Origin, our goal is to build a sustainable food system. Uh, something we realized recently is that our food system is not sustainable nor secure, and uh, we've seen that lately with various different shocks in the supply chain, and also if you take a look into how we're sourcing food and feed for animals, it just comes from all over the world, food miles and so on. It's just a a pretty non-sustainable situation. So what we do at Better Origin is that we use technology uh, to convert food waste back into animal feed using insects. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what we do. You want to go next, okay. Omer? <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming here. Uh, my name is Omer. I'm CEO and co-founder of Be Hero. Uh, the short version is that we are helping to future-proof our food supply while saving the bees. Uh, practically, we develop low-cost IoT sensors that goes into beehives, uh, and we help to track and monitor the health and the efficiency of those beehives as they are touring around to pollinate approximately 75% of the crops out there. Uh, founded the company originally in Israel, now we are spread across uh, Israel, Europe, the US, and Australia, uh, and uh, today we're the largest pollination provider in the world, so uh, things are going pretty well. Fantastic. <laughs> And I guess, so to start, maybe you could share, do you want to start photos? What is the level of adoption that you see of technology kind of broadly in, in your industry and, and maybe agriculture at, at large? Yeah, for sure. I think agriculture is one of those industries that was quite late in the technology kind of transformation. And uh, there's so much potential to change things, uh, whether it is from software and AI and improving efficiency or with new automation technologies to reduce labor and improve yields. Uh, and uh, our approach has been very much about finding what part of the supply chain is more ready to adopt a more sustainable solutions like uh, insect farming. And uh, in the UK, as you, you know, we started working with supermarkets because we think that's where um, they have a lot of decision-making power. And uh, they have all these milestones they need to actually hit around food waste and emissions. Um, so what we're trying to do with a supermarket, for example, is connect the two dots. So take food waste from the supply chain convert that into insect protein to feed animals that produce products that go back to the same supermarket. And we think that's actually quite powerful because we can convey the message throughout the whole value chain, starting from the farmer to the retailer and all the way to the consumer. So I guess that's an area that um, at the moment we see a lot of interest uh, coming close to the brand, coming close to the consumer and explaining why something's sustainable. Thanks. And in, in your industry, what is the level of adoption of, of new technologies and the willingness to embrace kind of more innovative and differentiated ideas? I think, yeah, I think we had this conversation backstage and uh, it's a slow adopting environment. I mean, I'm, I'm coming from the cybersecurity space, the cycles of which you can get feedback from the customers and improve and, and, and leverage is, is like on a monthly basis. And here we're getting into an industry where it takes you sometimes a year uh, to show the value proposition, and then another year until you can build a business model that makes sense, and suddenly it's two years into the business, and the typical startup uh, uh, structure usually needs to show results on a more uh, uh, faster uh, uh, time frames. So the adoption is tough. I think that there were companies entering the agricultural space with uh, technology before us, which, let's say, opened the door to at least listen to new uh, innovative approach to do things, uh, but still it's, it's a slow process. It's about building credibility uh, with more conservative markets uh, and trying to introduce, I would say, easier to digest business model. So even if you think you can improve so many things in the process, but it will take five years to prove, 
let's focus on something simple that can be validated early on. And I think this is what helped us at least to see quite consistent growth over the last four or five years. So how did that play out exactly at Be Here? Like what, who, how did you identify those early adopters and what was the initial kind of pitch? So first of all, it's door to door. I mean, when we started, it was driving to farms, knocking on doors, telling them the story. Of course, COVID made everything a little bit more complicated. Um, but basically trying to get those five, eight uh, uh, customers, like medium to large scale customers that are willing to give it a try. Uh, and, and making sure that everything works well. I mean, the early days of the startup, you, there are things that doesn't work behind the scene and you need to know that you can fix it on the long term, but you have to fix it now because if you fail, it's a done deal. Uh, so knocking on doors was the first approach, getting some traction with those guys, getting some of them actually happy with the solution that we provide and getting them to share this. Uh, and the second thing I think in, in our industry is conferences. Uh, it's actually the, the parties after the conferences where you close most of the deals, uh, but online marketing, um, cold calling, those things did not work for us. Um, a lot of uh, boots on the ground work. That makes sense. <laughs> and I think something that we were talking about already uh, backstage is you know, given the, the, vol the volatility and yields of broadly, um, it's much more difficult to prove the ROI in a you know, single data point or even a few data points. People question whether kind of, you are the cause of, 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 the, of the increase or, or the benefit. Is that something that, that you experience as, as well, Fotos? Yeah, massively. And first of all, farmers are probably the most skeptical people <laughs> in the world. We're speaking with the CEO of a big egg farming company, and they were saying that they just got them insurance for free, and 50% of the farmers think that they got scammed. So that's the level of distrust they have. And <clears throat> in our case, yeah, it, like the, as uh, Omar said, the cycle is about 86 weeks, so it takes so long to prove your yields. And that's why for us, we went to the farmers in the beginning, and they were like, unless we see the yield, it's difficult to adopt. And that's why we moved one step further up in the value chain, where you can actually start targeting some players that uh, appreciate sustainability and can see how this is the future, and can see how getting early in the industry will benefit them and then start uh, convincing the farmers. And something else we, we realized also experimenting with marketing that didn't work is that farmers only trust other farmers. So you have to build a community that they all understand that you're there for them and that you're there to help them. And eventually, if things work, they will actually make more money out of it. And so we, we've selected, in the beginning, we were kind of trying to work with everyone. Now we're selecting the people that we think can really support the business forward. And then we're holding some open days, for example, where we can buy them food and they can talk to each other about what they've experienced and why they think this works on the farms. And has, I guess, have you also considered the fact, so farmers only trust farmers, you said, so as you're building out your team, I mean, I imagine you're not looking for traditional salespeople who might be coming from a different industry. Are you hiring people who can speak to farmers on their level as well? Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, obviously, I'm not a farmer myself. I kind of get it, but I don't feel, uh, speak the farmer language. So what we've done now is we are building a team of young farmers that they're not salespeople, but they are quite open in speaking and they get it and then start training them to go and, and have a chat with the farmer. And, and uh, I think that works much better than any typical sales technique that they're going to see straight through it and they won't believe it, basically. Yes. Have you also hired industry insiders to, to help? Yeah, I mean, when we look at the, the strategy in terms of, of marketing or getting access, it's about identifying the relevant regions and then getting people that grew up in those regions and their friends are, are working in those farms and, and they know that they will not sell them something that they do not believe in. So it's basically a good opportunity, I guess, similar to your model of them to actually learn exactly what is it that we do, trust what we do, and then go and sell it because it's their name and they want to maintain their, their name in the industry. But you definitely need to get people uh, that can, can relate. I mean, my experience when we first got to the US, I came with the, with the laptop, you know, the, the Silicon Valley type dude, and my co-founder is a commercial beekeeper, is a second generation commercial beekeeper, and in two minutes into the conversation, I figured out that I'm not relevant there. Uh, and, and it was maybe hard to digest, but it was the right thing. I mean, Itai, my co-founder, just spoke to them the same language. They were touring around, looking at the equipment. It wasn't about selling anything. It's about how do you run your business? Oh, I used to do those things. And suddenly you, you start to build this relationship where you can trust each other, and then you are willing to give, it a tr to give it a try. And I think it's critical in this domain. And maybe to add on what you've mentioned, we are looking into sustainability. We see a lot of value in sustainability. But eventually it goes down to the bottom line. 
Like someone that uses our solution will not be able necessarily to sell their goods by 5% more just because they saved the bees in the process. So they want to make sure that, okay, they're going to invest in something. They want to support sustainability, but if, if the, bottom line, the bottom line doesn't change, then the ROI is, is, is in question, and this becomes harder to, to scale. No, absolutely. And you know, working with Photos, I know that when we first heard the pitch of uh, Better Origin, we were so excited because you know, your system had a laundry list of, of benefits. Some of them were economic. I mean, obviously, the bottom line is everything, as you say, but some of, some of them were sustainability, some of them were welfare. And as investors, that was something that we got really excited about, some of the sum of its parts. But when you go and you, and you sell that, um, you know, it turns out that some stakeholders may only care or may care more about certain areas and you have to sort of adjust your pitch. Can, can you talk a little bit around kind of how, how you're thinking about you know, the value that you create and, and how you um, kind of demonstrate and, 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 and sell that and, and hone your pitch to, to who you're speaking to? Yeah, for sure. I think that's exactly right. And uh, something we struggled early on is that there's so many messages, right? So we can improve the welfare of the animal, we can make the farm more sustainable, we can reduce food waste, we can cut down CO2 emissions, we can display soya. But then once you start talking about all these things, the message gets really confusing. And uh, so we had to kind of distill and pick one in every conversation, one that we think that the specific stakeholder will resonate with and they care about. Uh, and for example, when we speak to retailers, we know that a lot of them have made pretty big commitments around cutting down food waste by 2025. And also about reducing scope three emissions. And when you go a bit deeper into that, you realize that they have no clue how to get there. So for them, that's what matters the most. When you go to the farmer, to be honest with you, they care primarily about money and profit. So you want to talk about how eventually you'll increase the yields uh, and then about future proofing their farm and sustainability. So I think that's what we, we identified. But to Omar's point as well, at the moment at least, sustainability is, is just more expensive. It's not cheaper. So you need to find what pockets of, of the industry are ready to pay a bit more to adopt something like this. That makes sense, and I, and make, and I imagine it, it, it's intuitive that it's not, it's not the farmers at this stage. Um, interesting. And then I guess in the last, couple, in the last kind of the events of the last year, there's been a lot of um, you know, price, food prices are up, inflation is higher. And of how has that changed and of your, the value proposition of, of your product? How has it changed conversations? Has it been a tailwind? Has it been um, a headwind? Maybe do you want to speak? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, it comes to whether it's a nice-to-have solution or a must-have solution. So crops that require pollination still need pollination. Uh, so we haven't seen a major impact, but definitely we see a lot of um, motivation, I would say, to invest in, in technology or, or innovative solutions where the results are going to be shown in the, in the next few years. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies, um, you know, drone out from those R&D projects, and so... Yeah, I think it definitely affects the market. It's harder to be a farmer today than, let's say, three years ago, uh, before all the implications of, of COVID and supply chain and inflation and, and, and the war. And so th there are a lot of things happening. Uh, so from our perspective, definitely R&D collaborations were uh, minimized. <clears throat> yeah, in our case, we have been talking about sustainability and food security for like nearly four years now. And especially in the West, everyone was like, well, food security, what are you talking about? It's, it's, I mean, we're quite secure. And I think those two shocks back to back, like the pandemic and uh, the invasion of Russia and Ukraine, has really showed the fragility of the food supply chain when it's so interconnected and so globalized. So I think coming out of that, uh, it's definitely a tailwind because people see that the, the current food system, the way it's built, it's not sustainable. And we need to think about how we can increase the resilience and, and reduce the reliance of just importing everything. So people are much more receptive to listening about this. Uh, again, retailers and food producers are looking to reduce the reliance of importing feed, like soy from South America, for example. Uh, so we, we see that people are much more ready to listen uh, and take a call and try to explore new options and, and technologies. That makes sense. And maybe we could talk briefly about the role of regulation in, in, your, in your business. Uh, I, know, I know regulation is quite relevant for, for better origin. Um, what do you need, I guess, from reg regulators in the next couple of years in order to, to support your business and, and to move it forward in, in the regions that you're focused on? Yeah, I, maybe I won't talk about specifically insects because it might be boring for, for the crowd, but I think that the more wider thing is that we need to get to a point that quantifying sustainability is just common for everyone. How do you measure the impact of food waste reduction? How do you measure the impact of reducing carbon emissions. And I think we need to get to a point that governments 
regulate carbon credits. And it has to be the case because, as we said earlier, sustainability is more expensive at the moment. And the only way to actually figure that out is if we can develop a market that, by being more sustainable, you actually make somehow more money. Uh, and I think certain industries like automotive, uh, en energy, and so on, uh, are already there. And we can see companies in the US specifically really being successful in that way. Tesla is an example, for example. They make so much money from credits. Uh, but then it has to, ex to, to expand into food waste and, and, and feed and, and all these other industries that actually account for, I mean, food and agriculture accounts for 26% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And there's no, it's not regulated in carbon credits right now. So I'd say, in my mind, that's number one. And then we can unlock various different insect-related regulations uh, in, in the different economies. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think that if you can get some sort of a tax benefits, if you're considered to be sustainable, that's definitely something that will push forward this innovation in this area. I think it also goes back to what can be claimed outside. So we, we've seen a lot of initiatives trying to secure the health of pollinators in general. And in some cases, it was a marketing uh, solution for a certain company and not necessarily aligned with the real impact on, on pollinators. So we came out with this objective way of how pollinator friendliness should be measured and that can be adopted by anyone. So it's not something that beer is only doing, but at least to get some sort of, a, I would say even a coalition or maybe regulation into the process to try and support the, those efforts. So we know that if, if I do want to pay the extra 10% on, on apples that were pollinated in a bee friendly way, I can trust that this was actually a bee friendly way. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, <laughs> greenwashing uh, for on the, on the, when you have consumer brands, it really doesn't, doesn't help anyone. But that's super interesting that you've created this standard that other, that, uh, exactly, <laughs> that, that other people can use in your industry. Yeah. What, um, that's awesome. Well, uh, looking ahead, I guess, what, what, did, what are you excited about in, sort of for your business, for, for your, the, your industry in the next couple of years? Uh, maybe I can start, yeah. Uh, I, I think, again, as I said earlier, it, there's a lot of excitement about these new technologies and uh, there's all this push to reduce food waste and there's all this push to reduce reliance of deforestation-related soil, for example. So, yeah, we, I think that the industry will grow into a place that we become more local in the way we produce food and feed. Uh, and uh, also, so, something that Omar mentioned earlier, I think, yeah, sustainability will have to be equal to transparency to avoid greenwashing. And we're very excited about increasing the transparency of the consumer about how things work. So, because if they get it and they understand it, then they're much more willing to go and pay for it. So I guess these two areas are really exciting in my mind. Yeah. I, I think over the last probably few tens of years, we've seen how the farming industry is becoming more and more efficient. Uh, and we put focus on optimizing outputs. Uh, and, and in practical, we were mortgaging the future resources that you know, the next generation would need uh, to, to, to have food uh, availability. So what we want to see is definitely adoption of more sustainable approach that we know that, okay, we're using a lot of resources, but we're also recycling those resources. So we support the long-term uh, existence of, of human on this planet. Um, and, and for us, specifically for Be Hero, I think leveraging the data set that we've built over the last five years, which is, is huge, uh, introducing additional value proposition to most stakeholders in, in different areas, in seed production, beekeepers, uh, and, and other data plays, I think it's, it's quite exciting. So uh, looking forward to see what's going to happen next. <laughs> Me as well. Um, and in the last five minutes, maybe we can kind of talk about building the business on the fundraising side. Both of you are Maybe you, can you speak a little bit around your fundraising journey, kind of where you are today, who, who you've taken money from, whether it's kind of traditional VCs, whether it's strategics, and what kind of drove that? Would you want to speak? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think we're talking about that backstage as well. We've, as you know, we've gone more on the traditional VC uh, side, and uh, I guess the first few years we spent primarily time building the product, and that was uh, funded by grants. In the beginning, I think it takes quite some time to build the technology to show that you have a product and that you can commercialize that. Uh, and then it's interesting because in the last three, four years, the appetite for more deep tech solutions and the appetite for more sustainable solutions has definitely increased. Uh, and we like to try to merge those two worlds. So we take a lot of the learnings from the traditional farming industry and then from the VC approach into software, if you like, and then try to merge these two things. Uh, and now we're starting to explore more strategics because 
when you try to scale up, it makes a lot of sense if you involve a large company that can also benefit commercially from the solution. Uh, so yeah, we're looking to keep a blended approach. Makes sense. I think on our end, first of all, we had a similar journey, I guess, starting with grants. I think it also shows that the cycles takes time to, to show the value proposition takes time and, and finding investors in the very, very early stage could be difficult or very expensive. So the grants is definitely a, a great solution. Our, our seed, today we are post Series B, so we've raised $64 million to date uh, from, from great investors, strategic and traditional. I'll touch it in a second, but the seed round was tough. <laughs> we were basically spitting blood. We had the date written on the wall saying, okay, if we cannot raise money by that time, we're, we're going home. Um, it was tough because you're exactly in the stage where you start to generate this initial traction. It's not big enough for some of the investors and people are looking into the industry. It's extremely exciting. Someone taught, tell them things they didn't know about bees, but then when it comes to actually investing, how much do they know about this market? How can they support the company? And, and, and is it a niche that they don't want to deal with? And it, it was tough. Uh, and we were privileged to have you know, some investors to take the lead and push us forward. And the following year, when we uh, were looking into additional fundraising opportunity, we had the traction that we needed and it went a lot more smooth. I mean, it's never easy. Don't read the stories. It always takes time and, and it's, it's complex. But traction made the big difference. Uh, and I think it's about trying to find the fastest path for traction. For us, it was focusing on the Series A, Series B stage on strategic investors. We talked about the building the credibility in the market is so crucial. If you can bring a player like General Mills or Rabobank that are well known in the industry and the customers are looking and saying, okay, if they invested, they, they, they trust this can make a big difference, suddenly it makes the, the, the acquisition cycle a little bit more efficient, uh, I would say. That's awesome yeah, that you got through that challenging period and Oh. <laughs> uh, so I, to everyone here today, what would be one of the things that you want everyone in the audience to take away about, about your business? You know, I hear a lot of, there are a few other insect businesses in, in Europe and in the world broadly. What, what sets Better Origin apart or Be Hero? Kind of how, how, what are you excited for, for everyone in the audience to take home today? Um, <laughs> what we've done differently than most other companies in, the, in our sector is that we try to draw a boundary around a farm and a product and try to focus on that. And I think when you blend technology with, with nature, if you like, which is what we do, it's really important to factor in how the sustainability will make money as well. So yeah, I think that's the most important bit for me to try to find out in the current market who is more ready to pay for, for this more sustainable product. Uh, I, I think for us it's about expansion. So, you know, you, when we came to the US from Israel at the beginning, we were very confident that we know what we are doing. And then we uh, started to work with the, with the farmers in the US, and they were like, if you didn't prove it here, it doesn't mean anything. So we need to build everything from scratch, and I think that's probably one of the main question marks as we expand to other, other places. Uh, trying to leverage what we've managed to show so far to shorten those cycles as we enter new crops, new geographies, and so on. The experience is a bit different now, uh, but that's definitely something to take into consideration. Mm -hmm.